the way the the Roswell slides fiasco um, sort of um, unfolded on everybody uh, to me um, demonstrates that there's still quite a healthy amount of dysfunction in the UFO community. Yeah. The subculture. Um, the fact that um, there was no common sensical analysis done of the images before this big event yeah. meant to present them to the public. The fact that at a glance, you could tell that regardless of whether the body was human or a misidentified uh, extraterrestrial life form, uh, the fact is that what it was not, um, it was not an image uh, that um, was taken illicitly in a government lab. And uh, there was nothing in the image to suggest that it had any connection at all to Roswell. Nevertheless, the uh, promoters brought in, you know, um, the published authors, the two guys who have researched Roswell. Yep. They themselves tried to connect it to, um, to Roswell with, uh, you know, maybe varying degrees of effort. But... Um, Anyone who wasn't simply a promoter and trying to make a quick buck off of it would have seen the images, maybe thought there was something unexplained in the images, but would not have instantly associated them with Roswell. So the fact that that happened and that the, uh, the images have now been dismissed um, as a result of the first story being shown false just shows that um, nothing really operates the way it should um, when it comes to the people who are in this so-called field. Yeah, and it seems is that the people in this field behave in a standard fashion, which seems to latch onto these really false and insignificant stories and then create confusion in the discussion of it. So we have, for instance, Streber's journals, where he ends up evoking this particular physics that he's quite fond of, um, noting a grandfather power, speaking of the grandfather paradox and principles of least action, I think, without mentioning it, which seems to me purposed towards parking any active interest people could have in the subject. So somebody at a glance, first glance, looks at this story, thinks thinks there's something to it, looks at it for a while, then thinks, well, maybe there's something to it, but maybe there isn't. That seems to be the general affect uh, which arises from a lot of the sort of stories that come up again and again. We never seem to move past a certain point where the reality of the, the uh, you know, the reality of the phenomenon, which must involve actual flesh and blood extraterrestrials visiting the planet and actual nuts and bolts craft, um, that seems to never be really accepted. We never really move on from that towards some sort of social or political action. Never mind any cultural reform that would necessarily follow. What it was reminded of it in looking at Strieber's journal articles is a diagram I remember a lecturer drew on the board once when he's trying to explain the thesis of Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions where he he drew a box representing a governing paradigm and then around the box he started marking X's. We said these are this is the anomalous data that begins to accumulate outside the paradigm. Ultimately, a new paradigm has to be fashioned which has to account for this anomalous data. And it seems to me is that what happens is that within the field, so often as these points arise, there's this studied effort actually calling to question, well, do we really have an anomaly here or not? Maybe we do, maybe we don't. So we never actually move past this toward actually generating a new paradigm. Instead, it's parked into these, you know, foolish discussions by foolish people. So that was, you know, that's kind of my reaction to it. It's 
Well, there's a lot that could be said about it. This gesture of um, debunking or reducing something to the trivial, I think there's there's a lot behind that. You know, in the sort of ignorant people who, um, to whom this comes naturally, you find an almost malicious glee in the assertion that everything in reality is simply shit. I mean, not simply neutral, but the opposite of uh, fantastic and so on. There's a kind of sadism, I think, behind it. Now, that has no bearing on whether a particular debunking is true or false. So I'm not trying to debunk debunking and, uh, you know, cry sour grapes and so on. But I'm saying that there is a kind of, there's a latent satisfaction and a, a kind of psychology behind debunking, even when it's performed by people within the UFO subculture uh, on others. You you kind of see it emerge, I think. Now, when it comes to the way the whole thing unfolded and um, Strieber's kind of absent later day participation in it, in response to what you're saying, the the, the fact is that, um, and this will have a bearing on Kuhn as well, the fact is that if you have, for example, a so-called paradigm, which is a set of um, you know, propositions which are held to be true and all sorts of um, assumptions underneath which support the propositions and so on, and a certain body of evidence that uh, the theories, the paradigm, the ensemble of belief accounts for, and then outside of that you have anom anomalous data, the transition from one paradigm to another is as much as anything the focus of his book. In other words, the simple admission that what prevents a paradigm from instantly adapting or transforming into a more powerful or explanatory one is the social problem, the, pro the social problem of science, the social problem of belief. I mean, you can distinguish between the scientific method and science with a capital S, the culture of scientists pretty easily. And science as a social enterprise is what constantly gets in the way. You have the division into factions. You have the fact that uh, people become identified with a belief. And therefore, if you um, um, question the belief, they take it as a kind of imaginary assault on themselves. This is no different than what happens in the UFO field. You have the constant div division into factions and parties and, uh, you know, the kind of tribalism where they all gather around a particular idea or just set of vague notions, and then they divide themselves almost sociologically, insider, outsider. And you see it with the nuts and bolts, quote unquote, people who, um, you know, are sort of relics from an earlier age where the focus of these um, community organizations, you know, like the MUFONs and the earlier ones, was simply to catalog sites in the sky, and the, you know they became so invested in that as uh, the method of progress that when the abduction stories gained traction, they said, "Well, well, that's all bullshit. There can't be any abductions. That's crazy. Lights in the sky, you know, crafts with aliens in them. That's not crazy. But coming into your bedroom, that's crazy. So you see, it's absurd on its face to say one is less crazy than the other, but they nevertheless do so. Why? Because there's faction involved." the uh, social phenomenon of belief. So you have this lurching between extremes. It's not an intelligent or wise process. It's this wild lurching between extremes and what accounts for that lurching, the social dimension. So we start off, we have these slides and uh, there's something that might resemble an alien body in the slides. Well, it's presented, of course, as being the Roswell body and you know, blah, blah, blah. And this is going to appeal to a certain core group of people. But then you have another set, a different faction, motivated by a kind of intense hatred of the first group. And these yobs who uh, are in the Roswell Slides group, um, they belong to that group. There's one guy in particular, this, um, um, what's his name? It's, um, it'll come to me. There's a Canadian, I think he's the nephew of Stanton Friedman, 
And the guy has such a stick up his ass. It's unbelievable. And he's not above leaking private emails because he right. feels so entitled based on his hatred of these other people. So he, he, he feels so entitled that in the past, I mean, he's taken private emails before this all came out, having to do with the slides, he's released them to the public. And some people were thinking, you know, well, that sounds a bit questionable. I mean, uh, but anyway, so you, it's, it's, div- it's divided by factions, by one yeah. group uh, that opposes another group. And this is why the debate itself lurches between a kind of retarded extremes. So you have the thesis where it's the Roswell body. And then you have the negation of the thesis, which is, well, this is, uh, we've, we've deblurred the placard and it's a museum piece and obviously it looks like it's a museum. Therefore, the whole thing is dismissible. And then, unfortunately, because of the hastiness and the uh, absurdity uh, surrounding the way this is done, you have an opening for somebody like a Strieber to come in. Now, you mentioned Strieber and his participation in this Again, it's sort of after the fact, but it's absurd. The, the fact is that um, if you go to the Roswell Group website, and uh, he got on there at one point and left a comment asking uh, that the images be made available to him. And he said things along the way, well, this needs to be put to bed, he said. And, you know, the reason why I don't participate in the UFO community is because of this kind of nonsense, and we need to simply settle the issue. Oh, really? Sounds very reasonable, right? So he gets the images, and within the week, he's got Linda Moulton Howe breathlessly uh, on the Dreamland program with Jaime Moussan, the guy who's mostly responsible for the fiasco, now claiming that, well, if you examine the body in the image, it's clearly not human. Mm. So we've gone from thesis to antithesis to synthesis now, where, well, you know, we, we've, pro- we've proven it's mainly false, but now it's the truth is somewhere in the middle. But you have to ask yourself first, on what basis should we even consider that there is this, you know, synthetic truth behind the scenes unknown to everybody? You have the the promoter, Musan. Now he's the one putting forward these three medical doctors. And you might rightly ask, on the basis of what do these three claim? that this is an alien body. Well, there are anomalies in the anatomy, they claim. Well, how much of that is due to the poor quality of the image? And again, why should we look closer if this guy, Musan, has a vested interest in, you know, defending the slides and keeping his reputation intact? I mean, it's well known that in the courtroom, you can bring in witnesses on both sides of any issue. You can bring in three scientists who say one thing and three scientists who will testify the opposite. So you got a guy who's got a vested interest in uh, defending something, retaining something from the slides. He's got so-called experts, medical doctors. They're not testing the body. They're not examining DNA. Uh, they're looking at 60-year-old images. And, and Strieber is right on board because Linda Moulton Howe is, you know. So how much credibility does he have in that case? Well, let's put the issue to bed, and then we're going to come out with this weird thing. And this is to my mind, exactly what you were saying. You have this obfuscation of things that whether it's intentional or not on his part, he comes in and executes it perfectly. The fact that he would try to bring in these obscure principles from physics to try to suggest that, uh, you know, in some wild, crazy way that reality has refashioned itself so that, you know, we have to debunk these images. This is, in a way, the ultimate hucksterism. He may or may not be completely sincere in the steps that he's followed to to come to that type of assertion, but in the way it functions, the way that type of assertion operates, is pure hucksterism. It's like I'm, you know, I take the money out of your wallet, and you catch me taking the money out of your wallet. I'm like, no, no, it's just in your imagination, man. You know, <laughs> no, no, no. There are other obscure reasons why you're imagining this happening right now, and there are further obscure reasons why later, when you count the money in your wallet, it'll still be gone. Who would fall for that? So, yeah, it's it's interesting, you know. When you, you, you immediately spoke of the when you spoke of the culture of science, what I immediately started thinking of, well, there's a politics of science too. There's a distribution of power. And there's agencies agencies present in how that culture 
um, actually presents itself to to society at large. And I think with UFOlogy, what would make set what makes an awful lot of sense to me is that there is hidden action um, in in these debates or in these topics as they come up. I mean, naturally enough, I can't. There's nothing here in this story in and of itself to point to that, but it would seem to me that if there is, you know, if there is, if there is a, a hidden government effort to, to engage with this uh, subject in some way or not, then that government has an, an active interest in creating a general field of disinformation in order to disguise its efforts, hide its efforts. And what's long been obvious to me is how simple it would be to create a culture of um, of confusion around the subject like how few men you'd need how small a budget how uh, little determined a uh, little real effort would be needed in order to to completely stage manage how this how this science the science of ufology is seen by the society at large and what I notice is that when people come into contact with it, well, you're, you know, the question then is asked in the reader's mind when they look at, it, say, a story like this of the Roswell Slides is, well, so what? What's the so what here? So, you know, you're looking at another story, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, so what? You know, there's nothing to be done here. Whereas if you actually step back and look at what evidence is accumulated in the field, we're looking at how many thousand of images of craft, how many thousands of readings of craft, and thousands of sightings and contact of, of, of extraterrestrials, of creatures of some kind. And surely that in itself would demand a particular social mobilization, a mobilization that I know just never happened. It never happens. We're, we're stuck with Streber talking about fucking fairies again. <laughs> yeah, you know, th this is what I noticed. This is what I see. He's talking about, well, you know, Maybe it's not fairies. And it's just sort of mock intellectualism. You know, we're jumping from physics to anthropology, fields he knows nothing about. But he sort of flatters the reader into presenting in such a way that the reader thinks now he's some familiarity too about the subject. But all in all, the net effect is, is nothing. All in all, the, you know, the secret government and its agencies continue at pace. And this seems to be just happens again and again and again. And I, I've even seen it. I, I've no, for example, there was a couple of stories with Linda Moulton Howe. Um, to cut a long story short, I know for sure that the emails were intercepted and emails were deleted and she received certain parts of information. She went ahead with a story which made her look ridiculous. Um, and it's not, it's not to, it's not to, you know, lurch into the realms of, uh, you know, paranoia. You know, you can put in the U.S. Army Psychological Brigade. You can do that yourself. You can put that into, into Google, into Wikipedia. There are psychological warfare experts. It is ridiculous to assume they're not active in the subject. And it seems that what would they, you know, you can imagine this secret government. And we'll just call it that for now. That what they want more than anything else is they can keep the subject under wraps. And, how, and it seems to me is that when these stories come up, at the end of it, the net effect seems to serve that goal perfectly. People like, you know, look at a story like this, they sort of scratch their head and they just move on. You know. Um, well, on that point, you know, I'm, I'm with you in that it's not only possible, but fairly obvious that um, there are trained groups who undertake to, you know, seed discord and to destroy movements and so on, um, and they do it in a fairly scientific way. Now, how ultimately valid the science is, we don't know, but it's a lot better than doing it thoughtlessly. Uh, but the problem, in addition to that, is that it seems to me that a lot of uh, these efforts, because of the nature of um, the social in human beings, the, these efforts have a kind of like um, 
knock-on effect. You know, they take on a life of their own. So, I mean, uh, look at it in a more general scope. I mean, look at the way that um, the more overt government infiltrates and discredits um, political opposition groups like Occupy Wall Street and so on and so forth. I mean, they have decades and decades of experience. They've got techniques on paper. So they're undertaking something substantive when they try to wreck these groups. But if you look at the history of these actions and then the way groups get discredited and fragment, what you see is that it's almost as if, not almost, it is as if, let's say you have an opposition group that crops up. And let's say it's the very first opposition group to a given government. So it's like a brand new thing. Okay, it's a brand new social phenomenon. Everyone is aware that this is new. It's the first time there's an opposition group to the government. Well, then this given government infiltrates, discredits, um, causes faction, division, the group splits up, it's chaos, it's warring against itself, and so on. You fast forward a generation later, you have something similar reemerge, but this time the same pattern repeats itself without the government action. Why? Because in some sense, the people have come to understand that this is how that sort of thing operates. Like, this is what it means to have an opposition group. I mean, there are people who go into the group and without any kind of push at all will work for its destruction because in some weird way, they think that's what they're supposed to be doing. That's what it is to have a group. I mean, look at political parties and, and that kind of thing. That's way out in the open. And, you know, you see it on the news every night. And you see these people who sabotage their own collective political interests because in some weird sense, this is what they've been trained to do. They go in there. Uh, they, they don't cooperate. It's every man for himself. You know, everyone jumps into the lifeboat. The lifeboat sinks because it's got too many people. Mm. Nobody wins. You see it again and again and again. So I think if you're looking at the history of uh, the UFO world, that early efforts to destroy these organizations and destroy the distribution of information and so on, they have like a, a perverse golden aura around them where there are these payoffs that occur even after and even in, not even in the presence of, of the attempt. You know, you've got idiots in the UFO world today who are basically just morons, they're buffoons. Whereas 50 years ago, you might have had people who had spent their adult lives in science in a cleaner world, they come to the matter, you know, these people are not buffoons. And how do you account for the difference? Well, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm talking past the point, but it, it's, you're absolutely right to know uh, a group's fragment. There is, to give you a saying about the IRA, you know, they used to joke the first, the first item on the agenda of any newly formed IRA was the split, you know, to, to break <laughs> off. It was, you know, that was a joke. It was always the split, first thing we talk about. But, you know, with that, I think there is, there's something, again, like looking at this, um, th this dimension of psychological war, which has been played out. I think it's more insidious, far reaching and effective than simply trying to splinter um a cohering a, a cohering resistance let's put it that way. so you know to use just to look at the american government an example you know correct me here if i'm really really wrong but you had the black power movement in the 60s and 70s that was an example of where the fbi and you know various police departments made very real efforts to split and fragment those groups um I don't think that really is, in, in a way, um, representative of, of what happens in ufology. I mean, obviously, there are obviously there are obvious differences, but what I find happening is that the disinformation campaign is successful not so much in in confusing and disorienting a social movement, but it's it's. It is successful in um, confusing and disorienting individual perception of social realities, which, 
which prevents any sort of uh, emergence of a social response to the phenomenon at large. So we've gone from, you know, even go back, and, and this would be sort of my sense of from the 50s and 60s and 70s, there was no question that there were craft coming to the planet and there were extraterrestrials and that the, there was an, a cover-up involved. Yeah, that was sort of a given. And in that, you just sort of widespread acceptance of that. And then that itself naturally proceeds, is the, is the necessary, but alone insufficient condition for a sort of social you know, response to, to, what's, to what's been experienced there. But now what we have is we can't even agree on the, on, on the basics, basis of what we're meant to be perceiving here. So we have, you know, Wickley Strieber, it's fairies. You know, this is bringing up fairies. And then you have, you know, tr you know I think it was Mac Tony's obviously working himself repeatedly into um, ever decreasing circles of, of elaboration of various theses and ideas, which in and of themselves were not convincing and just generated, you know, a further discord in what people were seeing of the phenomenon. Um, and I see that, you know, very clearly with this, this sort of this, this, how this story is played out is that people look at it and think, well, you know, are, are there aliens? Maybe there are, maybe there aren't, and, you know, who knows, move on. I'll just look at pornography. That seems to be what happens here. And, you know, the more I sort of, you know, I'm sort of coming to this view, just noticing how, how UFOlogy seems to be in this sort of, uh, downward arc, downward trajectory, you know, I, I, I can only assume that this is sort of deeply intended by, by, the, by the powerful actors within, you know, the politics of the science of ufology. Well, I don't disagree with you. I would say that there are different, um, there are different um, levels of magnification you can apply to talk about where and, and what kind of influence and so on occurs. Historically, if you go back, I think, to the 50s and 60s in the United States, it was um, a normal thing to form and to join civic organizations. I mean, this was what adults did. And people would be members of all sorts of organizations, go to meetings and have dinners. And in that context, that milieu, UFO groups formed. All sorts of UFO groups formed. They treated it with a kind of um, good-natured seriousness at that time. And the interventions that took place around that time were designed to divide, to destroy the organizations at an organizational level. That, I believe, succeeded. It was a complete success because the issue never had enough credibility, uh, it could never grow, and uh, you know the mainstream could be turned against it pretty easily. So when you discuss the kind of individual level interventions that occur today to drive people nuts and so on. I think that occurs today, perhaps largely thanks to the fact that the more basic collective destruction of these groups and the chance for social movements and so on was a complete success. I mean, today, um, you have no credible, serious minded group of people united with even a very general purpose when it comes to the UFO issue. It's all faction, it's all craziness. But on top of that, by the same token, you're right. You have the you have the stories of the my lab abductions, quote unquote, where all sorts of people describe something which seems even more um, black and horrible than straight up abduction stories. You know, there are human beings involved, there uh, military, their uniforms, you know, they're beaten, they're raped, their minds are wiped clean, you know, there's all sorts of crazy stuff. And the interception of communications, which you mentioned, the alteration of communications, that's routine. And m murder, we know that happens. I mean, of course, in some cases, it was happening even in the 60s, maybe before. But um, perhaps by virtue of the fact that we're at a later stage now, these sort of horrible you know, gaslighting efforts on individuals take place and, you know, they're driven nuts and they're, 
their perceptions are so confused that people trying to gather something from their accounts are unable to say what the hell's going on. So I think you're right there. You know, when we're talking about various groups, you know, obviously the last couple of days, as I said, I've been giving some attention to the disclosure project. And I mean, that seemed to be a quite a broad based effort for a time at least to force a public public disclosure. And yet it itself, despite its initial success, initial presence, if you like, 2001, 2002, it seems to just hit the buffers. You know, there's nothing came of it. There was no public response, didn't really translate into any meaningful political action. Um, and, I, you know, I wonder too, is this, you know, just coming back to what you were talking about, that in the 50s and 60s, there was just an inherent tendency in, or not a tendency, but the presence in American life of, you know, intermediate social institutions and groups which have largely disappeared i mean this is something that was noted even i think it was christopher lash i just read a quote from him in a different context when he's speaking of the culture of narcissism whereas the the once present re- individuals reflex to respond politically to particular situations are given away to some sort of interiorized individual you know individual response and he noted this in 1980 i think it was and then, you know, on top of that, you had Robert Putnam, who talked about I mean, his bowling alone again, and he just noted this in the late 90s, the sheer collapse in civic participation in the U.S. I think that would be, again, it's, that's mirrored throughout, you know, throughout Western Europe. You know, political party membership, for instance, has, has really fallen. Um, and this sort of points to, you know, that, that broader social trend of, of atomization, for want of a better word, and how that then impacts on um you know the the subject of ufology and the groups we see there become naturally ever ever weaker um ever more splintered and ever more impotent the um i mean the united states historical context i mean the quote you mentioned i agree with completely the there was a long tradition of civic organizations and spontaneous organizing and so on that stretched all the way back into the 1800s you had these temperance movements. You had the people who, uh, you know, wanted to get rid of all alcohol and so on. That was going on for a long, long time. The uh, woman suffragettes movements. I mean, it was a, it was an easy thing. It was a traditional thing. And like-minded people would form an organization, and you know, they would probably elect officers. And this was standard. I mean, it was just part of the cultural life. And on all types of issues under the sun, this went on. Now, that tradition was in place even before the turn into the 20th century. When you came out of the Second World War, rightly or wrongly, you had an even stronger identification with this kind of um, community-minded consciousness because in the United States, when everyone came through the war, it was very much a kind of collective endeavor. That's how it was experienced. So uh, it affected all levels of society. Um, So many people were involved in the conflict as soldiers. They came back. They had seen the world. They had all sorts of practical knowledge so they could get shit done. Um, They weren't saints, obviously, and not necessarily devils either. But the fact is that you had this combination in the U.S. of the victory conditions, uh, the experience of victory. You had the fact that you had all of these young men come back who now had know-how. They'd also seen the world. You had this um, economic uh, success that followed the end of the Second World War. So everyone was now suddenly at a new standard of living. So that was kind of like the height of things in the U.S. And as a result, these civic organizations and civic participation was maybe at its peak. The thing is, is that in the 1960s, when the dark hidden powers, you know, performed all of the assassinations, they basically murdered all of that. They murdered that whole mechanism of identifying with a group in order to affect social change. They really destroyed it. Now today, rightists, uh, you know, conservatives um, in the U.S. blame the hippies and the people on the left for all of that. But the fact is that 
these countercultural movements were simply a symptom of what was already happening. With the JFK assassination, you had this shock wave that went through the country where people, even if they didn't understand it intellectually, they knew that basically it wasn't right. And uh, even among the people who would later come out and say, oh, well, you know, assassination bullshit, you know, who could have a conspiracy? You know, it's impossible for two evil people to ever meet in the same room. They knew, everybody knew. And the way that that was handled destroyed the country permanently. Then you have the following, you have the Martin Luther King assassination and the Bobby Kennedy assassination, same type of thing, even Malcolm X. And the fact that the leaders that grew out of these movements, like the, you know, the, basically the, the brain the, and the heart of these movements in the form of a concrete person, these people could simply be murdered, meant to everyone that no change is possible. You also had the Vietnam War, for Christ's sake, which was a war that nobody believed in. The people who supported the war did so simply because they thought whenever your government goes to war, you support them. But nobody ever thought that there were good reasons to go into Vietnam, even the people who supported the war. The people who were against the war, especially all of these kids who were being drafted to go die, they said this, you know, the whole system is fucked. And that's why, you know, all the famous slogans like uh, turn on, tune in, drop out or whatever, people just dropped out. And through the 70s, you just had this kind of like exhale. And it was done in the 70s. I mean, you had still lingering just through like um, ritual, you know, had these, these civic groups. Right. But the sense of collective enterprise and that and that spontaneous notion that you could just simply to get together and push for political change because you wanted to, that was done. Right. By the end of the 70s, it was over. So it's no surprise. It's no surprise right. that, you know, the atomization of, of individuals, as you say, is no surprise that that occurred because there were precise historical conditions that brought it about. Right. And it found an echo then in 1980 on the right with the, um, I says proto-libertarianism that it represented. You know, he moved away from that old, uh, what would you, I don't know what you call it in American context, but sort of one nation conservatism in the 50s and 60s. Um, I'm not sure what variant republicanism it's called. Um, I missed uh, when you said who you were speaking of. What, uh, what well, person? Reagan. Uh, you know, you're talking about the 70s, you know, you're the hippies on, on, on the left, the crude political spectrum. You know, you're this dropout, you're the, the left surrendering their, you know, their, their political, political presence. And then 1980, as a compliment, you see the same phenomenon on the right, where you move towards um, a neoliberalism, which replaces the, uh, the old mainstream republicanism of the 50s and 60s. Yes, that's exactly correct. I mean, instead of being a sort of old line, uh, I think the term typically used in the U.S. is paleoconservatism. Mm. But instead of being basically aligned with national interests, businessmen who were in line with national interests, basically, right. it became elitism, ben- yeah. you know, pure benefits to going to the elite. And um, the people on the right were just as much to blame as the people on the left for that. You know, I mean, the left. There is no left in the United States. Maybe we discussed this before, but they abdicated all responsibility. And um, one of the signs of their powerlessness is the way that they would caricature a right-leaning leader. So this is standard. So even people like Hunter S. Thompson are fully guilty of this. Nixon was in there. The people on the left demonized him. And, you know, they're actually... I think religious echoes in the way that they would do this, but they, they create this caricature of this Republican president as some sort of uh, demon. And they did it with Reagan and they did it with Bush, you know, the second Bush. And that's their routine thing to keep going back to it. But Nixon was socially liberal by today's standards. Right. I mean, if you realize this and Reagan, even though he had all of these anti-communist credentials and he was, uh, you know, running constantly on uh, a platform of, you know, we need more military spending and so on and so forth. Reagan was not himself necessarily this caricature that they painted him to be. And, I mean, when you reduce your enemy to a caricature, basically you signal your own powerlessness and 
that your movement is exhausted. So it seems to me that that recurring attempt by the people on the left to just pick a Republican president and uh, paint him to be a demon showed that the left was already gone. And by that, do you mean that a failure to actually engage what these people such as Nixon and Bush actually do points to an absence of any real alternative program? Is that the, is that the point? Well, partly. Partly that. Partly the fact that um, if you're only thinking in terms of caricature, you, have, you indicate that you're not really thinking to begin with. But finally, the, also partly because it shows that you no longer engage with your own ideals. If you are truly passionately committed, for example, to something like what they call social justice or progress or any of these ideals, the landscape at a given moment, you have to recognize in its entirety. In other words, if you're driven by the principle of, of ending injustice, that principle will, because it's a principle, enable you to see the landscape clearly. You want to see what it is. I mean, if you are in the woods and you're being chased by a bear, there's no messing around with, um, maybe I should believe uh, that it's behind this tree because my uh, buddy believes it's behind this tree. Nothing like that ever happens. I mean, it's it's a hard example to give. But No, no I think it, it's a bit like the, you know, there's an example given. I, this, this might really speak to it, but with military intelligence, it simply has to see what it is if you have any prospect of, of victory. You can't uh, underestimate the enemy's abilities or exaggerate them. There you go. There's, a, there's yeah. an experience. There's a dedication to total clarity that occurs only with total honesty in pursuit of some urgent right. ideal. Now, as soon as they start caricaturing and then every decade doing the same thing, Queerly, it's just about this new tradition or ritual of caricaturing the conservative president in this way. See what I mean? When they start repeating themselves, it shows they've got nothing new to say. And when they've got nothing new to say, they're bankrupt. Right. So, I mean, you go back and uh, they treat Watergate like it was this incredible success. The people on the left, you know, uh, oh, it was this wonderful success. And again, I'm not a conservative or right leaning or anything like that. But. These morons treated Watergate like it was a huge success because they did, got rid of this evil, satanic, right-wing president. When now we see that there's evidence that it was the CIA who wanted to get rid of him anyway, and that the whole Watergate break and thing was a front, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what did they actually accomplish by doing that? I mean, the, the, what, where, what was the social change? Mm. I mean, the system only continued to become more corrupt. Right. So it's like this false victory. And then they relive the ritual. Oh, we had this great victory. The movement's bankrupt. And you see it today. I mean, all the so-called thinkers on the left, none of them impressed me as being truly sincere or ahead of the game or inspirational for those reasons. They're just kind of like uh, social functionaries. And um, that, I mean, that's a result, I think, of the... Uh, the historical events that took place in the U.S. So when we get back to, you know, UFOs and UFO subculture and so on. It's an, it's an echo of that, isn't it? You could almost paint it, you know, you could, you could draw from the same well. You can see that the um, secret government, just to use that shorthand, represent in some way, you know, they're obviously a conservative presence, whereas UFOlogy, you would think, should be something of a progressive force against that. But what do you have? You have, you know, endlessly, um, you know, bemoaning the, the, the machinations of the secret government without ever really coming to an understanding of why they act the way they do with a view of trying to transform the, you know, the social and cultural landscape in a way cognizant of the presence of, of this phenomenon and able to take advantage of that presence. Yeah. I mean, what you see in the UFO subculture today is really just, I mean, the collection of misfits. Yeah. Who are these people and why, why does it not go the way you would expect? I mean, this is something that you've highlighted in past conversations, and I think it's a very valuable way to look at it. The fact that this sort of natural, organic um, organization of individuals into groups because they have a common interest. I mean, 
and and to do so competently and practically and in, in pursuit of, for example, UFO truth or whatever. Why hasn't that occurred? Why is it some sort of perverse, deranged counter scenario instead? Yeah, and moreover, and moreover, look at the victory that that government has had. It can't even it's managed to succeed groups forming which seek to bypass the government. You know, you, you'll actually notice there are no groups out there who actually say, look, we're banging our head against the fucking wall with the secret government. Well, fuck them. They don't represent us because they're illegitimate. Why don't we just openly try and communicate with these people ourselves? Like, how, how has that never happened? It, like in the U.S., how, does, how has that never happened? That a group of people form in that way? I point to the U.S. because it's the broadest, deepest, you know, you know culture within the subject. You know, when people say, let's, let's try and bypass all this nonsense and let's find out for ourselves directly. They're there. We're here. They're intelligent. We might be. <laughs> so let's see what happens. And it's just nothing. Well, there's truth to what you say. In some measure, you could say that that occurs somewhat. Um, in as much as you have these groups who get together and they, you know, they go out looking at lights or they go to the UFO conventions and so on. Um, but I guess the, I guess it's kind of one of three, one of three situations. I mean, the best situation would have been an organic movement with its own momentum. People who knew what they were doing, they had their own direction, and they, um, <laughs> you know, they made it happen. Well, that never took place. Um, the opposite scenario is kind of what you see today, with total disorganization, um, no sense of collective endeavor at all you just have a bunch of individuals who will come and sell their books at the ufo conference and you know right. make the little podcast and that's it and then the third which is sort of what you describe where people get together and they try to initiate contact and perhaps mostly unsuccessfully but also you have in streber the notion that um contact is now democratized precisely because the government failed to act. He at least has made that point many times in uh, over many decades that they supposedly attempted to uh, engage us in the 50s and 60s with all of these flybys, and, you know, peering over Washington, D.C. and so on, and we failed to respond correctly. So now they bypass the government themselves and come to us. I suppose that's slightly different than what you're saying because it's them to us rather than us to them. Mm -hmm. And whatever cases of us to them exist, uh, they're pretty weak. Yeah, it's well. What I would say is, you know, with, with Streber, he does he does say that you know it's up to the, in, the individual can they contact. But Streber's opus, in a way, is an extended warning about that effort. Streber's been, to <laughs> say the least, yeah, he's been very ambivalent about their nature. I can't remember once he wrote as dangerous as plutonium. I mean, who in the right mind is going to reach their hand out to something like that? So in a way, he, he, he serves that purpose. Like, I'm, when I speak about this, I'm, I'm not sitting here. I, can, I'm, I, I even find my own absurdities in my thinking, my own absurdities in my response to this. Like, I've you know, read Streber so much, I've taken on board what he said. When I, I unpackage my own thinking, my own understanding, I find these anomalies. Um, I watched a talk by Greer, where he said a couple of years ago under Sarkozy, the French government were, they were on the cusp of an open acknowledgement. And, and with the view of beginning a, um, an open, open-ended process of engagement with, with extraterrestrials. Now, I'm not sure what came of that effort, but does at least su suggest that perhaps other governments elsewhere have taken a different view of this than the US government it might point to that there is, as we know, or as we're told, there's some good fragmentation um, in the management within the secret government and in the management of the subject. There is, and thankfully the cultural differences that still exist on planet Earth allow for some variety in the response to uh, the overall phenomenon. But um, I'm very doubtful of the sort of 
constant refrain from people like Greer and others that disclosure is just on the horizon mm. and that it's, it's on the horizon with this country, or that country. And um, I think they have in one way a kind of vested interest in that recurring anticipation because that's kind of like the emotional um, satisfaction that they try to represent to people. Right. Like I represent the emotional satisfaction of disclosure. So uh, come listen to me talk and so on. Here's the disclosure scenario. But um, on the other hand, there is some value, I think, in the so-called disclosure movement. It's a shibboleth is what it is. And in, in uh, linguistics, the shibboleth, you know, will be if you have two people um, who speak very closely related dialects, but one of them will have a phoneme additional when that phoneme is spoken because of the you know nature of um, speech and comprehension and so on the person in the other group may not even hear it because it doesn't belong to their speech set okay. and you can distinguish i mean the, the the definition of meaning normally given to this term is that you can distinguish one group from another insiders can distinguish themselves from the outsiders because something that's recognizable to the insiders alone tells them that that you know they're the insiders it's based on the basis of their own recognition what makes them an insider somebody else who doesn't recognize it is right. not and i think the disclosure movement so called operate the same way now you have factions in the ufo world some of these douchebag assholes who you know the younger types who have their podcasts and their friends and you know they they just repeat each other's talking points but they think they're against the machine right well these guys despise Greer for often legitimate reasons and they think the disclosure movement's all bullshit and so on. But they're seeing it only from within the inside group. In other words, the inside group of the UFO world. Right. They see how Greer and disclosure functions within that little subgroup and they yeah. evaluate on that basis. But to people completely outside of it who have nothing to do with any of it, the sheer fact that you might have former military officials on a panel in Washington, D.C., at a press club uh, with apparently solid credentials saying this happened, this happened, this happened, is actually significant. Yeah. Now, without saying that it's definite, measurable progress, you can at least say it's significant. And it likely has a totally different dimension to people outside the UFO world. And I think all of these efforts do, the, the petitions and so on, the sheer fact that they are trying to bring the UFO issue into the political without speaking of its potential success is at least something different than what it is now, which is just basically like this internet hovel that people use as a toilet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, you know, it is. I've even noticed that some of the print magazines in the UK have all gone out of business. You don't see them anymore. Um, you know, there's, there's no, there's very little interest. As far as I can tell, it seems to be just declining interest in the subject. And what I find, you know, what, what I, I actually see that as a piece of with our present economic decline. Simply put, as people's economic lives become ever more precarious, and they are across the Western world, you know, permanent. Employment's becoming less permanent, shorter term contracts, longer hours, you know, weakened unions and the rest. I mean, as, as labor itself, as its sort of conditions become more unstable, the culture that we associated with a very solid set bourgeois is evaporating. And that included individuals having the time and money and energy to develop hobbies and interests in any number of directions. I mean, we have spoken earlier on about how civic life is disintegrated, but there's also that personal cultural life goes with it. And, you know, you can pick up, you can pick this up in, in any number of directions, just in terms of uh, what television is watched, what, uh, you know, movies people are watching, what books are, are being read or not read. Um, I think it, I think in that context you see UFOlogy just 
you know, it's 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 up there with you know, hus- you know, breeding huskies. It, it's just so obscure. It's you know, it's just of no significance. It's not. It's never seen to have social significance. So I suppose that's that's really what you know. My theme for the evening is that you this total denial of social significance. That seems to be the product of so much of the chatter inside the hovel. Um, you know, what are you left with? You, you le- you're left with a secret government, however you want to still construe it, who's free to act as it sees fit without any sort of meaningful social opposition. And moreover, I actually see this getting an awful lot worse. I, I, I think ufology is just, it's just, it's just going to further enter further decline, further disintegration. Um, to the point now, you, you know, I can see something like a Light Years, a book written by Gary Kinder. It was an investigation of the Billy Myers story. Something like, like that was written in the 1970s. I can't see anything like that being written today. This this book, for what it's worth, was a serious effort and investigation by a serious journalist with money behind him to get into it. You'll see nothing like that now. Um, and you know, I, I I don't know what that means. I, I don't even know what it means and why in and of itself that would have to be particularly significant. But I I just see this um, almost unstoppable decline in the subject, unless the subject itself splits between those who are still debating these various aspects and these various sort of secondary stories that come up, and maybe groups which establish contact and work within that context. Now, that might be a bit of a sort of a far-reaching point, but I, I think if there is a, if there are intelligences outside our world who do seek some sort of communication here, they themselves will surely recognize that a certain form of engagement becomes meaningless at a certain point, or a certain form of engagement is, is just um, impossible. If we see this ongoing retreat of ufology, as any sort of presence in the in the you know the collective social mind, then I would expect its form to change. I would expect their response to us to change, in maybe very exciting ways. Well, if the phenomenon itself decides to change the way it behaves, then I think what you say is absolutely true. Yeah, I mean, all sorts of things could happen if it changes. When it comes to simply us, if we're left to our own devices, I also agree that. There's an unstoppable decline, not only in terms of ufology, but in terms of civilization. I mean, things are just the, the humanity in the, when it, in terms of humanity, things are just becoming worse and worse and worse, and they're not going to stop. And this civilization, I think, will devour itself. That's the only way social change will occur. It will completely devour itself and everybody else, and then it'll be you know total disaster. Hmm. Now, when people talk about disclosure, I think it's precisely for that reason that disclosure will not happen. In the U.S., the government lies about everything. So why would it tell the truth on this most absolutely risky of subjects? It's totally arcane. It's political suicide. I mean, with zero benefit to it at all. Why would it all of a sudden come out about the truth? I mean, it lies about the unemployment. Unemployment figures and lies about uh, everything, uh, covert operations, I mean, killing Osama bin Laden, total lie. Everything's a lie, but it's not limited to the government. At least in the U.S., the corruption of the civilization is so total that, I mean, there was an article um, a month or two ago in The Lancet. I mean, it was a, a piece written by the editor-in-chief of The Lancet, which is, mm-hmm. you know, one of the two main yeah. top medical journals and the guy said that you know half of medical studies are fake yeah and then there was another article uh, i think a year or two back by somebody else new england journal of medicine maybe saying that scientific studies are now so routinely 
you know, false in terms of the data being massaged and the reporting, you know, people trying to get government grants and people trying to make the news that science is a joke. And yet at the same time in the U.S., people who don't want to give their kids 400 vaccines are decried as being, you know, maniacs, um, uber religious fundamentalist types and so on, as if the only reason to distrust science is because you've, you know, got some sort of superstitious outlook. I see everything in every direction from that vantage point as just being irretrievable. I mean, I don't see any kind of hope when it comes to culture, the political, any of it. You know, it's, it's, it's like you've got all of these wheels in motion and they just have to work themselves out. You can't, I mean, they, and they affect each other. And perhaps 50 or 60 years ago, you had a certain degree of freedom. But today, everything's pointed in the same direction and it's downhill. So when they talk about disclosure, they should ask themselves, you know, in what social political environment are we pretending that there will be disclosure? If somebody says, yeah, I think 20 years from now, that's a nice figure. You know, 20 years from now, um, there will be disclosure by the U.S. federal government. Well, what will it look like in 20 years? Yeah, I know. The political environment today is totally different than it was 20 years ago. It's 20 years from now. What are they even speaking of? Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you know, and then the, the U.S. government 20 years from now, it, they, they will be. We can say it almost categorically as, as much as we can know anything. They're going, they will be much more beleaguered than they are now. You know, world population continues to climb inexorably. You have climate change running at pace. The U.S. will have its fair share of natural disasters to contend with. But the problem also, you know, in the industrial realm, Automization, what's that going to do for employment numbers? Um, an aging population, a less educated population. Yeah, so, so it would seem to me that with the, you know, with the military industrial people within the US, I'm sure many of these men are in, in the way simple patriots in that they, they, they love their families and they love where they live and, you know, gee, they just like it to do well. And it would seem to me that this secrecy is a tremendous trump card for the United States, broadly considered. I, I can't see why the U.S. would surrender those advantages. It's surely garnered from these illicit studies. And I have to be, you know, I wonder is that surely they think that they have an edge over the likes of Russia or China, which in itself makes, puts an interesting twist on in any sort of analysis of UC of events and developments in the world today. Um, that maybe, the, the, you know, you would have to think that part of the cabal thinks that they will be able to score an end run or, or an end run past the demographic and resource conditions which give rise to the United States' particular condition today. They may be able to see a world that might have to go through a bloodbath to get there, but a world where American supremacy is is insured for centuries and in a world which is which is happy which is it's, it's a it's a genuine pax america pax americana people are simply happy to sit under the direction of washington dc um and you would have to think that perhaps that the wherewithal for that sort of uh, new global dispensation exists within within inside the secret government yeah, absolutely. I've you, know, learned... he, he, you know, if I can just add to this, I mean, if, say, Obama, you know, he, he sits down with them and says, man, we've got to let all this shit out. And say, you fucking nuts. Why would we tell the Chinese about this stuff? You know, and he, he's, he's seeing this from, you know, you know an African-American who wishes for the uplift of that particular part of the population, especially. He can say, well, what, why would we surrender those advantages? And, you know, something else that comes up in reading Greer, Greer often makes reference, not directly, but he often makes reference to this sort of fact, quote unquote, fact that if, if things are going to happen in this world, you know, there, there's stuff that's going to happen. There may well be this secret government thinks We're going to let this stuff happen. And this, this is grand historic shakeup. We're going to come out on top. We'll have the weapons to flatten. Anyone who stands in the way of that chaos, 
and we will ensure that the United States isn't four or five percent of the world's population thereafter. We're going to be 30, 40 percent. And our allies, they're going to be another 30, 40 percent. Everyone else, well, they can just fuck off. And, you know, I, I can just see how this is sort of spelled out. And it's way past this good and evil thing. It's simply, we're on a lifeboat. We've sprung a leak. And, you know, we're going to have to start throwing guys off pretty soon. But we'll patch that boat up. We've got the stuff here in our pocket, how to do it. But we're going to patch it up, and then we're going to be sailing pretty hereafter forevermore. Um, it's something that you just, I, I think when people talk about the military industrial complex, military people tend to think in terms of victory and defeat. You know, surely as they, as they sit there looking at the world and they see the same dismal facts as we do, maybe they do plan for victory. You know, maybe there are Napoleons and, and Hitlers in there. We really think, look, let's use this stuff. We can use this. We can, we can win once, now, and forever. And they, they have a vision of a new world. And, and moreover, here's the better part. Maybe this is a necessary step for the development of any civilization on any planet. Somebody needs to actually win and impose an order on the planet as a whole. You know, and it, it's something that doesn't seem to me too ridiculous. That this, no, this, I, I wouldn't call it ridiculous, no. Yeah, this cabal says, look, we're going to get over the hill of this sort of population bubble we have and this, this resource bottleneck we're going through. And once we're on the other side of it, we'll, we'll just ensure, we'll get it right. You know, we'll control, we'll control growth. You know, we'll get proper treaties in place, put in proper trading mechanisms. We, we will actually set ourselves up for centuries of peace. We've got the technological base, we've got the historical experience. There'll be some form of global Jeff Jeffersonian democracy. I'll, I'll be a people by the, by the right sort of people, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, that, that's, you know, that's something, I don't know, kind of drift away from what we're talking about, but I, I find I find a very interesting speculation is, is, to, is to wonder about, to think about the military industrial complex or people involved in the 9-11 conspiracy. If you could get them to sit down and just say, look, why did you do it? To hear them speak would be a fascinating discussion to tell. Like someone like Chen. If you could, you know, get Chen, you get a few drinks in him, say, come on, what's it all? You know, really, what's the plan here? And it's something I noticed amongst the left is the poverty of the analysis. Rumsfeld and Cheney after more money. I mean, that's, that's pathetic. Pathetic. Men in their 60s and 70s with more money than they know what to do with. That they would engage in such high conspiracies for a few dollars more. It's ridiculous. Anyway. Well, it's a legitimate question. And I'm fully with you on that. I've asked it myself in the past. You know, what is the psychology of these people. I mean, you look at the uh, great novelists of the 19th century, like a Dostoevsky. This is somebody who could study people and then and understand the psychology of them, what made them tick, and then write about it. And when you're talking about these figures of world historical importance, like a Cheney and so on, you know, these ruthless assholes who put things in motion that end up costing millions of lives and so on, it's, it's got to be endlessly fascinating the the truth of the psychology and you're right the idiots on the left there again they prefer a cartoon caricature than the evil truth now when it comes to the military industrial complex and the ufo cover-up specifically while i take your point that military people seeing things in terms of victory and defeat could very well in some scenario at some point say we're going to now bring this technology out to ensure a certain kind of victory, it may also be the case that the military people are not the ones in charge of it, in control of the technology and the facts and so on. It might be intelligence people. And that's the angle I've come at it from when I've thought about the same question. You know, the thing that strikes me as being the most fundamental feature of these intelligence people is the psychology of secrecy. What is the psychology of secrecy? You look at it in the most general way, um, the, pe the way people nurse secrets in everyday life, um, people with terrible secrets that they hide. Or, you know, what is the effect on the psychology of the person to have such deep, terrible secrets? You look at the professional lives of a lot of these spies, and uh, not just the ones who come out, you know, 
um, to the you know when it's revealed in the news media, but people who we don't hear about who are doing far more secret type stuff, they lead double lives, sometimes triple lives. What does that mean? What does that do to a person? 